welcome to Forbidden Planet TV. I am Andrew Sumner. This is Evangeline Lilly. How are you, mate? Good, how are you? I am very well, thank you. Very well indeed. Mate, how have you been since we last met? I'm, gonna, I'm just going to challenge that I am very well. I'm going to say, I think grammatically speaking, it's I am doing very well or I am good. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I am good never sounds right to me, but I'm I doing very well is, is uh, yeah. yeah. I've noticed in the UK, I think as a rebellion against the American mistake of saying, I am doing good, which is wrong grammatically, right? It's I'm doing well. And so when someone says, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing very well. That would be said in the UK and, and, and the US, they would probably say, oh, I'm doing real good, you know? And, and, and so there's like this rebellion against that that I think has gone too far. Because when you say, how are you? Many people in the UK will say, I am well. I don't think that's grammatically correct. <laughs> Brilliant. How, how, how are you? Yeah, I'm very well. Yeah, I would never say I'm doing good. That's for sure. Yeah, oh. yeah. It wouldn't even cross I'm my mind. You're doing well, yes. Yeah. I'm doing well, thank you very much. <laughs> well, I love the fact that we've immediately leapt into grammar and how the English are mis misapplying grammar. I love that. That's great. Yeah, that's, a very, very... that's a very bold swing in the first, first two minutes of the conversation. I think, so. I think so, but I'm very passionate about grammar. I have a, I have a, what's called a copy editor for my children's storybooks. And she basically goes through and just makes sure that all the tiny little, like every I is dotted, every T is crossed and that all the punctuation and grammar are exactly as they should be. She doesn't do anything in the creative side. It's all very clinical. And I geek out with her over little, she'll be like, I think that this probably shouldn't have been a hyphen. And I'm like, okay, listen, I thought long and hard about that hyphen. And this is the reason why I used it. And we'll have these back and forth. And she was, she was like, you're my first client who actually likes this stuff. I, was <laughs> like, I love it. I love grammar. I love language. I love, um, yeah, literacy. I just think oh, it's dying. And I, I mourn that in a time when we're on our phones and writing to each other more than ever. I mean, right, we're barely speaking, speaking a whole other thing, but we're writing to each other more than ever. So more than ever, we need our punctuation and our grammar to be on point so that we don't have so much miscommunication. Meanwhile, punctuation and grammar is being completely abandoned in schools. Nobody gives a shit about it anymore. You can text. Oh God, it drives me around the bend. It drives me around the bend. The thing that drives me absolutely nuts because as you know, I edit books myself and I have a lot of these conversations as you, as, as you also know, I'm a big grammar nerd too. Uh, and, um, but what drives me around the bend more than anything else, if there's one thing, it's, it's the large scale inability to figure out the difference between apostrophe S and S plural. I, I, I just don't get it. I just don't get what it's a really easy rule. Why don't people understand that? To my 11 year old son's brain right now. I'm like, how is this not sinking? Why can't you understand? It's simple. This is one of the simplest grammar rules you're ever going to encounter. This is not difficult stuff, guys. And it's so widely misapplied now. It's kind widely. of, it's, it's like watching the fabric of society crumble around you, fall Art. apart. Yeah, right on. And, yeah. um, and it, it, of course, you're mentioning your, your process with regard to creating your your children's uh, book series, the Squicker Wonkers. You just you you just off the back of a very successful, almost mini tour with the books on it. Yes, I am. It was very mini, um, but I, I, it was actually way more successful than I expected it to be. And that might sound a bit defeatist, but um, what's really cool is uh, this is the third book I've released in the Squicker Wonkers um, series. So the first book was. Uh, called the pre-show it was sort of an introductory book initially it was a standalone book I wasn't sure if it would turn into a series because I wasn't sure how well it would be received but I was prepped and sort of ready for it to be a series and then um, it was really well received and um, critically it was really well received which meant the world to me for me I the squicker wonkers is, is this dark cautionary tale about naughty marionette puppets so I knew it would probably never be a highly mainstream thing but my intention was always to capture the imagination of the audiences who are looking for a slightly more elevated content for their kids that aren't looking for the, just the, the another teddy bear encounters a problem and then overcomes it and everybody's happy story. Um, and so I was really pleased to get 
critically um, well noticed. Um, and so I carried on. And so now this is the, the second book in the Demise series. So it's, um, there was the Demise of Some of the Spoiled and I just released the Demise of Lorna the Lazy. And with each new book, um, very, very, very happily, um, it seems that our little cult following just multiplies and sort of exponentially gets larger. And, and I noticed that this time around, when people read the third book, they were like, oh, I need the first and the second book. And so suddenly I'm dealing with, I, I'm the publisher and I'm the author and I'm the IT person and I make the website. And it's sort of just a little one man show I do for fun. And, um, and it got a little out of control in the last two months. I was like, I can't keep up with this. This is more than I expected, which is the best, most high class problem you can have in you know anything any endeavor like this is like oh it's too much I've got too many sales and too much attention and it was it was very nice it was wonderful for, for those who, who who perhaps haven't watched our um our, our previous Forbidden Planet TV um conversation yeah could, could you just um fill everybody in on the premise of the series yes so um the squicker wonkers is a troop of 10 traveling marionette puppets who put on a thing called the squicker show and it's essentially um a show that is a test of character and if you pass this test of character then you might leave their haunted enchanted wagon none the wiser that you had just been put through some sort of a test you just think it was a show or a game um but if you don't pass the test of character then um, a much more sinister fate befalls you. And um, in the opening book of the series, spoiler alert for anyone who doesn't want to know, plug your ears for the next three seconds, um, Selma, our main character, does not pass the test of character and she is transformed into a squicker wonker puppet. And that sets up the series of books called the Demise series, where we follow these 10 vice-ridden characters. Each of them has their own particular vice. There's Andy the Arrogant, Mama the Mean, Gillis the Gluttonous, Greer the Greedy. There's, there's, they all have something that, that always trips them up. And we watch them go through adventures um, of their own. Each one gets their own book and they come to a very unpleasant end. So um, I call these cautionary tales for modern day brats. And uh, one of the reasons that I was inspired to write them is I, I feel like the books that most intrigued me when I was young were the books that dealt with the shadow side of life that no adult seemed to ever want me to know about or be able to talk about. But there were some authors, and one in particular was um, Edward Gorey, who for me as a child, um, spoke to my intelligence, spoke to my understanding that there is some dark shit in the world and that I want to know about it and I want to understand it. And I think it's a really important thing to give parents a sort of bridge into their kids' darker world and their struggles. And I think these books can do that. I think they can open up conversations for parents to be like, what do you think your vice is? And how do you think that could bring you to an unpleasant end? Or what, what are the ways that you could notice that along the way and maybe not turn out like Selma devoured by a beast or Lorna burned alive? <laughs> These are really, really dark stories, but they're dark humor. So my mentor, when I was first writing them, gave me the best advice and he said, your darkest moment should be your funniest. And so that's what I'm always striving for. Um, and it's and it's also, I think, a really good exercise for parents and children to learn to laugh at their own mistakes, to learn to laugh at their own shit and to acknowledge it and to talk about it and to get it out in the open. I think um, in 2022, we have very strangely moved into a, a borderline puritanical um, social state and um, like social state of being, not social state like government, but a social state of being a, a, a very puritanical one. And I think um, I really believe in visiting the dark spaces and acknowledging them and laughing at them and learning from them. Yeah, very well said, very well said. I, 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 something I wholeheartedly endorse. And um, you're just back home um, from being in the UK. You did, a, you did a kind of mini trip to the UK. You did Wales Comic Con. You, uh, you came and visited us at uh, the flagship Forbidden Planet store at 179 Shaftesbury Avenue. Did a very successful signing. How was all that for you, mate? 
It was fantastic. On the way there, I stopped in Richmond. I did a comp con there, headed over. I spent 10 days in Cornwall, just having a little mini vacation um, with my partner. And that was breathtaking. Um, St. Ives was. An I, I love St. Ives. Such a great place. So beautiful. So the whole we've been so lucky with our weather in England. Um, so we were in England, of course, for six months shooting Quantum Mania. And last then we were year, back yeah. there last year. And then we were back there now for the Squicker Wonkers, this little mini Squicker Wonkers tour, where, like you said, we visited the Wales Comic Con and, and went and did a book signing at Forbidden Planet. And um, I, I got to say, like 90% of our time in the UK in the last year has been glorious sunshine, beautiful weather. And um, so we got really, really lucky. And, and it was really cool to be back at Forbidden Planet doing the signing because Titan Books, who is the publishing arm of Forbidden Planet or vice versa, um, is, uh, is the, they were the first publishers of the Squicker Wonkers books. And so I've gone back to self-publishing now, but it was like a little homecoming coming back to the store and, and they are still carrying their original published version of the Squicker Wonkers and, and then um, signing for the other two books that we've released since. It was really cool. Was really yeah, that, that's lovely. Um, anybody checking this out in the links attached to our conversation, there's a there's a there's a, a little uh, short film shot by our friend Phil Wallace um, of yours and uh, Rodrigo Bastos Didier's visit to Forbidden Planet, and it's it's worth checking out. You'll you really get the sense of uh, of what that was like. Um, it looked like he had a really good time as well. Rodrigo came all the way from Brazil, as you'll see in the little mini video, which by the way, was so well done. I was so impressed. He did a beautiful job. Um, uh, but yeah, he came all the way from Brazil. We both were actually coming from a ways away. I think we both traveled about 30 hours to get there. So I was coming from my home in Hawaii and he was coming from his home in Brazil. And for Rodrigo, he is such a soft-spoken, gentle soul. Um, but he's not shy. He loves to interact with the fans or the readers in this case. He loves to meet people. He loves to sign the books. And he's always putting, if he's got the time, little sketches in the book and really personalizing it for people. And I, I know it's it's part of what keeps him going because neither of us are doing this because we're going to become millionaires off of this. We both have day jobs. We both do it in our spare time. Neither of us can ever seem to do it fast enough because we've got too many other things going on in our life but we carve out the time and, and, you know, we just do it. We just force ourselves to find space and time in our lives. And I'm always grateful when Rodrigo manages to do that for me in the Squicker Wonkers because he's a very busy guy. Um, and, uh, and his artwork is absolutely breathtaking. I, I think it's the star of the show. I think his artwork totally outshines my stories every time and I would have it no other way because I am an art fanatic and I collect children's storybooks mostly I would say based on the art like I if there is a really amazing story that has absolutely terrible art in it I'll still buy it but I, I just don't treasure it quite as much as a, as a book that has like maybe a sort of a weak story but the art is just blowing my mind like I'll I'll probably revisit that book more than any of the other ones um so I'm glad he he elevates the books to a whole other level with his art and we spend a lot of time with the details and the art. We do a lot of planting Easter eggs for the kids. A lot of the mythology of the stories can be read through the art, but is not written in the stories. And it's our way of creating a series that you can read from three years old to 13 years old, you know, to 30 years old, if you really want to, because for the little ones, visually, it's so stimulating. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've yet to meet a three-year-old who doesn't have a very strong reaction to the book. Either it becomes their favorite book immediately, or they're like, that's terrifying. <laughs> I don't want to read that book again. Um, and, and they're very captured by, again, sort of the dark themes. I, I see those little ones just being really, they, they latch onto that. They want that. They're hungry for it. They're curious about it. And then visually, they can't keep their eyes off of the illustrations. And as they grow and they get older, there's this next level of the cautionary tale, which is really important, I think, at the developmental stages of a seven or eight year old, where they're starting to step into their independence and understand their own nature and their own character separate from mom and dad. And they're grappling with that and they're needing to understand the ways in which their choices really have real world consequences. 
And then for the older kids, somewhere around 10, 11, 12 age, there is a lot of mythology wrapped into the series that eventually after the 20 books that we're gonna release um, will, will become something that you can sort of decode throughout the stories. And I have a couple little girls who are eight years old and they're quite bright for eight. They're really good readers for eight. And the, every time they see me, they're like, I think I figured something else out. They just, they wanna decode it before they finish all the stories. They've only got the first three and they're already decoding it, which is really fun. Oh, that's that's so wonderful. And how was your uh, how was your experience at the at the two UK conventions? So I did the one convention in Richmond, Virginia, which was in the US. Oh, and sorry, Richmond, Richmond, Virginia. Right. I thought you said Richmond. you guys have a Richmond. In yeah, the UK. It, it, yeah. It, it's in West London. I'm like, I didn't even know there was one on in, in Richmond. <laughs> that's like literally on my doorstep. I thought that's strange. Okay, now it makes complete sense. Richmond, Virginia and Wales. Got it. You know what's so funny is that when I was living in the UK, I couldn't believe in in the area that I was I was living in the Chertsey area. And I would drive around, you know, I wouldn't have to go very far. And I would see so many signs that were exactly the towns that I'm from in Canada. So we also have a Richmond, we have a yeah. Surrey, we have yeah. a Langley. There we had there was a number of Westminster, New Westminster, we have so it was all in the Vancouver area, which is where I, you know, did most of my growing up in the latter year, in high school, college, university. So that was really bizarre. It was really trippy to be driving around my hometowns. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, but, but in the home counties in the UK. Yeah. So, but no, Wales, Wales Comic Con um, was, uh, was, was, was so cool. One, I think one of the highlights for me was I got, there were so many of my um, Hobbit friends there. Yeah. And I got to reunite with Jed Brophy and Andy Serkis. Uh, and wonderful. Like, yeah, it was so, I have guys I haven't seen in like, what was that, 10 years ago we made those yeah. movies? I can't believe it was 10 years ago. But I was nursing my oldest son on that film set and he's now, his 11th birthday is in two weeks. So um, yeah, it's been it's a long time. It's amazing that The Hobbit is already 10 years ago, let alone yeah. the original Rings what movies, but The Hobbit's 10 years ago. That's incredible. Yeah, it was so, it was so cool. It was really, really cool to see those guys. That must have been a real treat. I, I saw a bunch on your on your Instagram. I saw a bunch of your your pics with your fans and whatnot, and it looked like you were really investing in the moment, and you looked like you're really having such a lot of fun, you know, with all your, your photo ops with them all. That's the only way to do it. I mean, uh, one of the best. I think Wales had some of the best uh, cosplay I've ever seen at any con. They definitely had the most cosplay I think I've ever seen at a con. I mean, for the number of people there, the percentage of people who were fully decked out and dressed up was impressive and makes it really fun. It sort of brings out the child in you when you're surrounded by a bunch of people dressed up as imaginary characters. And, um, and you know, those days get really long because I, you know, over the course of two days, I will have met and tried to really give a proper experience to nearly a thousand people personally just me alone so each day i'm i'm meeting about four to five hundred people so if if i just sort of sit back and like yeah hi to everybody uh, my day is going to be miserable let alone their experience that they've been looking forward to and they've paid a lot of money for and it's a big event for them so i think everybody has to come with their a game and like make it fun and make it an event and have it be just a party you know that's what a con yeah. should be yeah, and then I, the day because you're having a good time. I, hey, man, I, I mean, it is. I I think uh, cons are a beautiful experience, and um, and are flooded with positivity, and that's absolutely the way, absolutely the way to embrace them. And, and, and Evangeline, before we go, you had a very productive, even though it was pandemic ridden, you had a very productive 2021. Some of which you've touched upon before. Uh, you released a great new movie with Jason Sudeikis. You, you worked on uh, Quantum Mania and uh, you launched a new podcast. So what real quick, what can you tell me about those things before we go? Um, I can tell you that, um, yeah, like you said, even like not even though, not in spite of the fact that the pandemic, we were at the tail end of the pandemic, but actually I think because of that, I had the most creatively satisfying year of my career. 
And I think it's because, and I, I'm sure so many of your listeners are going to relate to this experience. Um, while the pandemic was extremely difficult for a lot of people, on I, for me, primarily just psychologically, I think I'm one of those lucky people who got to sit in an ivory tower and wait it out, you know, and I acknowledge that. And there were so many people who struggled desperately in a sort of physical way. But psychologically, there's nobody who went unscathed, nobody. And I think what that did for a lot of people, including myself, is it really forced me inward. And I ended up with a lot of time to do some really intense inner work and integrate some of my past traumas and work through some of my pain and come out the other side a freer, more enlightened, more authentic version of me. And one of the areas where that I had always struggled with that was in my career, where I felt like it was very easy for me to sort of just get swept up and, and, and carried along on the wave of whatever was the next project that would come along. I found myself being able to actually sort of hold back the machine and say, no, wait, what do I really want to do? And how do I really want to do it? And make some really intentional choices. And so um, the, the movie you talked about with Jason Sudeikis was a movie called South of Heaven that was directed by Aaron Kasheles, who is an Israeli director who did a movie called Big Bad Wolves. And because this is Forbidden Planet podcast, I know you have the perfect kind of audience for that movie. If nobody, ha if any of you have not seen Big Bad Wolves by Aaron Kasheles, please see it. It's the craziest. It's great, great film, great film. Such a good film. So I, I wanted to work with him because of that film. And I also fell in love with the character Annie and um, had a lot of fun creating her with Aaron. And, and then also, of course, Jason is such a charming, good guy. And, you know, you're always looking to work with good co-stars. Co you know, they, a film shoot is too intense and too long not to work with wonderful people. Um, and then um, our podcast was, was truly, I mean, maybe I could actually point to it as the most satisfying thing I've ever done in my career because it was the most authentic me you're ever going to get. I mean, my life, if you sneak into my private world and you're a fly on the wall, my life is books and spirituality. I mean, that is what my life revolves around and learning and growing is, is paramount. It's central to everything, you know, who I am and how I spend my time. So getting to really openly talk about that, which was a bit nerve wracking because of course, spirituality and religion can be an extremely divisive topic in an environment in a time where everything is really divided. Um, but it was so rewarding because there just wasn't negative, angry, brutal feedback that was coming through. I posted a lot on my socials about it. And actually what happened was um, we started having, me and my fans started having these very long, very intimate conversations about our lives, our feelings, our beliefs, how they impact us, how, what we want, what we long for in our, our world of belief and our world of spirituality and what, what's lacking and how we get there and the things that inspire us. And they started, a couple of them started saying, I think we're breaking Instagram. I don't think you're supposed to have conversations like this on Instagram because they were so meaningful. And um, that was incredibly rewarding for me as a person who's only ever wanted to just put good stuff out in the world that helps people and and helps people to grow and, and feel good. Yeah, I, I, I amen to that. And that podcast is Evangelina Lee's Library of the Soul, which is uh, you can find on all podcast platforms. And you, you mentioned briefly what I was going to say myself. I don't know. There's something about that co-host you have on that show. I really like that guy. <laughs> he really speaks to me. You know. <laughs> he was he was also not so bad looking. If you go and watch the YouTube video, <laughs> he's kind of a dapper a dapper guy. Of yeah, course, it's, it's... Andrew. For those of you listening who don't know, Andrew was my host. He was my <laughs> co-host on that podcast. We did it together. And what was great, Andrew, is you. I mean, I'm speaking. You know already, but to the audience listening, was that Andrew came at this podcast from a space of like God and religion is a bunch of bollocks, and I don't buy into That's any so of true. it. <laughs> And I yeah. came at it from the perspective of it's central to my life and it's, yeah. it's, it's what makes me who I am. And so it was just such a fantastic thing to have two people who completely disagreed, look for the spaces where they hard agree 
because um, of course it was hosted by Andrew's podcast, Hard Agree. And we found so many spaces where we hard agreed. It was sort of like our own little Taiwanese experiment, like what we were talking about earlier, where the Taiwanese government is looking for the areas in which the population do agree as a, as a, through a social media platform and the algorithms of that platform, rather than looking for the areas where you disagree and you know up up voting all of the the what was the word you used the outrage yes the outrage machine the, the outrage, outrage machine now ours was the ours ours was the uh, the anti outrage machine ours was the the discourse machine right. Yeah, the, uh, uh, the temper machine. Let's temper our yes. extremism and come into a place of connection. Yeah. No, it was a it was a hugely enjoyable experience, mate, as you know, and something I'm very proud of as well. And finally, before we go, I know because I know the way these things work. There is not much you can tell me about this. But how was your time filming Quantumania, and and what what are your ambitions for it? Well, um, I actually, what's, what's great is what I can talk about is sort of the theme that we started on, which is my own personal growth on, on, on that film. That was, I think, the first time where I, I really, again, just probably because of some of the healing that's happened within me, um, which is partly, you know, I will give credit to, it's partly fueled by um, the Me Too movement and the Time's Up movement that really helped um, me to feel empowered to have a voice and and not to be afraid to use it and and not to feel like I'm being obnoxious or a bitch or difficult and what was really incredible was to for the first time ever really really say I have an opinion I have I have a lot of opinions and I'd love to share them and I'd love to give you um, my thoughts on all of this and and to do it with confidence and to do it with clarity instead of before I even speak already being brushing my own ideas under the carpet, which is an old habit of mine. Like, yeah, this probably isn't a very good idea, but, or you don't have to use this. I'm just gonna tell you what it is. Like all that stuff that I think is, is a very um, common habit of a lot of people. And, and it was definitely a habit of mine, but instead saying just really openly, here are my thoughts. And that's a really vulnerable thing to do without the precursor. It actually feels really unnerving because you're making yourself vulnerable to somebody not liking it without saying you might not like this and that's okay. And that was really empowering for me to um, be heard and to have my ideas actually really, really well received and valued and then to see them wind up in the, the final script. Um, you never know what's going to end up in the final movie. <laughs> because half of this film is made in the in post you know it's it's cgi and they're constantly reworking the story and the characters and the ideas and the visuals so you know you really do as an actor come to the premiere as an audience member you really don't know what to expect but the process itself i probably felt um in both south of heaven and quantum mania i felt probably the most heard the most respected and the most collaborative that i've ever felt in my career as an actress um, and so that it was a really empowering year. It felt well, great. I, what a wonderful place to be in. What a one that that that's great, you know. And uh, and uh, South of Heaven is is absolutely uh, recommended by yours truly. Such a such a great film. You must be so proud of it, and I know you are. And uh, it's it's a wonderful piece of work. And of course, everybody watching this massively looking forward to anticipating Quantum Mania, which I, I think is twenty twenty four. Right, it's not out till next year. I think it's 2023. Oh, is it? Which is next year. Uh, We're in 2022. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Man, I, I've deleted a whole year of my life. I wonder why that is. There must We're be. getting in the heart of that. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> On that time traveling note, it's been wonderful to see you. Thanks so much for coming and joining us at the store. It's always wonderful to see you and we're looking we're all looking forward to seeing you again i know all of the team had a great time hanging out with you and Thank um you. and well, before, uh, before you extra before you you kick me out of your room um i do want to just make a plug and tell everybody that if you are interested in checking out the squicker wonkers go to the squickerwonkers.com that's where i exclusively sell the books now um you can get the full series there you can get the audio books on Audible, iTunes, iBooks, um, and the website is thesquickerwonkers.com. Did I say that? And on Instagram, it's at thesquickerwonkers. The spelling, if you're like, I cannot spell squickerwonkers, just go to Evangeline Lily Official on Instagram, and it's the link in my bio. 
and, and everybody watching this, you can find all of those links in the links attached to this conversation as well. So you've just got to just look below this screen on YouTube. Just look at the base and you see all of that laid out for you as well, very neatly and nicely. Uh, it's always great to see you, mate. And I very much look forward to seeing you soon. Yeah, you too. Thanks again, Andrew. It's always a good time. I didn't I didn't bring my my camera Ryan whiskey uh, or whiskey and ginger this time. I, I just had some. What is this? This is TWG tea. Which I'm, dr I'm drinking virtual whiskey and ginger, which looks like a cup of tea. I tell you what you didn't bring. Uh, also, just to close out, and that the, I, I, uh, the my my only disappointment in this conversation. <gasps> you haven't got the brains glasses. Where are the brains, brains glasses? glasses? I didn't wear them today. Oh, Andrew, I've let you down. I've really uh, let you down. I uh, know, right? Yeah, five, four, three, <laughs> two, one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thunderbirds. I'll go next time. Next time, mate. Yeah, take time. care. I'll see you soon. Bye. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.